It is Wednesday afternoon. It is March 2nd, and we are blessed to be back in the Word. We'll be looking at Genesis chapter 3, Bereshit chapter 3. We'll be picking up in verse 6 in a quick review, and then we'll go into in-depth detail as we pick up in verse 7 where we had left off. In verse 6 we read, When the woman saw the tree was good for food, that it was a delight to the eyes, and the tree was desirable to make one wise. Three different points there. She took from its fruit and ate, and she gave also to her husband with her, and he ate. She saw. We Again, this is review, so it's quick. She saw. She allowed her mind, her emotions to be influenced by Satan, who was <coughs> sowing doubt into her mind about the word of God. She gazed at that forbidden tree. I think that was a longing look. She was tempted. She saw it was good for food that appealed to her physical, to the, the bodily appetites. Uh, that's called the lust of the flesh. Then she saw it was pleasant to the eyes that appealed to her aesthetic senses, to the emotions within her soul. It's called the lust of the eyes. And thirdly, the pride of life is seen when she saw, saw that it was desirable to make one wise. That appealed to her mind and to her spirit. It was pride if she was wanting to have knowledge like a God and be like a God. That's the pride of life. We looked at 1 John, 1 Yochanan chapter 2, verses 15 to 17 last week. It also talks about the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And if you take a hard look at what we know to be sin, you can put, probably put every sin under one of those three categories. It's, it, they, if something falls under at least one of the categories. This is how Satan comes at us today, in the pride of life, in the lust of the eyes, in the lust of the flesh. And earthly wisdom will not keep you from his temptations. If you're not solid in the word and close to the Lord, you're going to succumb to his temptations. He works from without to get you within. And God works from within to change you and have it come out. He works from the inside out. Satan so works from the outside to try to get in and corrupt you on the inside. She did eat after questioning, after doubting, after modifying God's word we saw because she said, I'm not even supposed to touch it. And he probably was touching it and, and enticing her. You can touch it. Look, I'm, I'm, I'm alive. It didn't kill me. You know, whatever. But rather than being submissive and obedient to God, who's given her no reason ever to doubt him or to question him, she instead became self-seeking, self-centered, <coughs> self-willed. She was thinking about herself. The steps to sin are like that. The forbidden fruit, whatever it is, the first step down is looking at it. Desiring it's your next step. You're not going to desire if you're not looking at it, but if you open yourself up to look at it, you're going to, if you proceed down that path, you're going to desire it. Then you're going to take it. And then you're going to eat it. It's that action. And then you even quite likely will share it with others and help bring them down too. She gave it to her husband. She caused him to stumble from being obedient to God. And between the two of them, they threw the whole human race into sin. <coughs> Thank you very much, Adam. <laughs> now having said that, none of us would have done any better. So don't let pride lift up in yourself that you would have done better. If that were to be true, then I'll just flat out ask you, then why didn't God put you there? You know, because he knows it all. So what we see is it's the will of God that was reject, resisted. The will of God was resisted. The word of God was rejected. And the way of God was deserted. And if you listen to that, you'll know where your key is. Your key is God in his word and knowing his will and his way. She gave to her husband. Sinners today do the same thing. She felt impelled to lead Adam into this, to participate in that same sin. She probably used the same arguments on him that Satan used on her. Look, I, I didn't die. And, and wow, this was delicious. This is good. You want to experience this. Whatever she did, she drew him in. We're told from 1 Timothy 2.14, again, we looked at it last week, that Adam was not deceived. Eve was deceived. Adam willfully chose to do what he did. It's deliberate sin. And then we saw that those consequences fall on all. But he chose to sin. 
Some say, well, he did it because he loved her. Well, okay, but if that love had been in a proper order where he loved God more, he should have been leading her to God. Remember, she was his help me to help him complete the assignment that God had given him to do. So both fully responsible for themselves, but if he chose it because he loved her, then he already, that was him putting, coming up to put something before God. So whether you can say that or not, I kind of, I can't quite go there because I think the first sin was eating the fruit, but it, it could be all, you could say it's all package deal. The, it all related. Yes. What was the warning? The will of God was resisted. Or? The will of God was resisted. Resist. Okay. Yeah. The will of God was resisted. The word of God was rejected. And then the way of God was deserted. You know, we find the word leads us, gives us the way. So if you reject the word, you're going to lose your way. You're going to desert God's way. Yeah, he knows best. I don't care what you're in. I don't care what's going on. God knows the best. If we plug into him, then we can do what's best. But if we reject his word, we resist his will, and we, um, we desert his way, we suffer the consequences. So many people want to say it's God's fault. You know, I'm getting ahead of myself. Somebody else did that too. We'll talk about that when we find out who said that first. <laughs> okay, I'll stay on track right now. So, when Adam and Eve failed in their testing, this was no surprise to God. He knew what was going to happen. He already, before the foundations of the earth, he had already planned the plan of salvation. Yeshua already had planned to come into the human race and be the second or the last Adam. And our scripture that we read last time, 1 Corinthians 15, 45, maybe we better, let, that's so critical, let's go ahead and go there together today. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 45, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 45. I sound like a broken record, but I know sometimes we're writing something, we don't get everything. Okay, so also is written, the first man, Adam, Adam, became a living soul. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. Adam came alive because God breathed into him. Yeshua came to bring spirit, <coughs> spiritual life, into the human race by his succeeding where Adam, Adam failed. Um, what Adam and Eve lost for us, Yeshua regained for us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, in light of that, we looked at Yeshua, Jesus' human life last time, and this is where we left off. This is Matthew 4. So before you go all the way back to Genesis, stop off with me at Matthew chapter 4, and it's verses 3 through 11. We're not going to read it all. I'm going to let you do that on your own. But I want you to see that Yeshua had gone into the wilderness. It's been 40 days um, that he's fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he's become hungry. And if that isn't an understatement, I'm even told scientifically that's when real starvation sets in, is when you've gone that long without. The fact he could make it that long, uh, to me, attests to who he was, that he was already in the power of God who, who uh, had created his human body. But the tempter came to him at that point of weakness. And when does the tempter come to you? When you're strong, when you're in the Word, when you're feasting on the Lord, well, He will then too, but you'll be able to resist better. And He'll definitely come to you when you, you've been isolated and you're weak. And in a COVID world still, isolation has been one of His key ploys. If you are isolated, plug in. There are ways to stay connected. We need that with each other. Uh, but he comes to him and he tells him in verse 3, If you're the Son of God, command these stones become bread. Remember, he's hungry. He's basically saying, you're so hungry, you're starting to starve to death. If you're God, make the stones bread. Have a meal. What's your problem? Show that you are, you know, who you are. He's appealing to Yeshua's physical, the, the um, lust of the flesh that we talked about earlier. Okay, that's verse 3. Then if we jump down to verses 8 and 9, we see in these that he appealed to the lust of the eyes. 
the devil, the Satan, took him to a very high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory, and said to him, All these things I'll give you if you'll fall down and worship me. Now, first of all, Satan, being the prince of the power of the air, has this kingdom in his domain right now. It is a world full of sin. Because this his, because Adam gave him the rights back to it, he was able to offer Yeshua, I'll give you the world. All you have to do is bow down to me. Just, I get to go up on that throne, you get to be subject under me. He's appealing, look at all you'll get. And you know what? You don't have to go to the cross to get it. You don't have to suffer. You don't have to go through that agony. I'll give you a shortcut. He's appealing to his eyes, to the emotional desires, to the, the soul itself that, that would want that for himself. Okay, in the humanity, all right? We know that, that Yeshua Jesus didn't, didn't fall, didn't falter even, I'll put it that way. But before we talk about how he took care of it, go back up to verse 6, and verse 6 is where we see the pride of life. Verse 6, he says, if you're the Son of God, throw yourself down. For it's written, he will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Okay, you say that you are the Son of God. All the angels should be at your beck and call. Jump off and let them rescue you, and the whole world will see you're a God and they'll worship you. He's appealing to that pride of life. Prove who you are. Prove you're the Son of God. Do something that shows it. Now, should you should say, you know what, you're right. Here's an opportunity to show who I am, to show my power. And we know absolutely not. It's not Satan's way. It is God's way. His life did show the power of who he was. did show who he, that he was God. But right here, all three times, <coughs> Yeshua answers in the same way. Now you can say, wait a minute, Rochelle. I read three different answers. Yes, you will read three different answers. But just before each answer are three words that are the same. It is written. Dora gets an A+. Plus. It is is written. It is written. Now what's written? What's he talking about? He's talking about the very words of God that we're studying today. He's talking about the scriptures. He's talking about what we have at our fingertips. But he didn't have to say, um, wait a minute Satan, let me go look up and I, I know there's a verse. I, I know there's got to be something here. Now, we all do that. But my point is, get into the Word. Hide it in your heart. The Holy Spirit will bring it back to remembrance. The more you have in your heart, the more arsenals you have, the more weapons in your arsenal that you have. Yeshua Jesus knew the Word of God because he is the author of the Word of God. But it tells us where we get our answers. Every time that was his response. Verse 4, verse 7, and verse 10. Read it on your own and you will see. Today, unfortunately, there are many who are in the church. And I put it in quotes. Oh, I'm a good Christian. I live in a Christian country. I go to church. I give God my one hour on Sunday. Aren't you proud of me? But what kind of a church is that? How many people in the pews are weak? How many people in the pews depend on the pastor to spoon feed them? Well, a baby needs to be spoon-fed, but if that baby's feeder is gone, what's that baby going to do? That baby needs to grow up so he can feed himself, so he can take care of himself, so he can answer. And that's what we're being encouraged to do. Get into the Word, learn the Word, find your ammunition. If you have a weakness, find the answer in the Word of God and then cling to it. And I guarantee you, you start quoting Scripture, Satan's going to flee. He doesn't want to hear it. And, and the saying goes also, um, Satan flees when he sees the weakest saint upon his knees. You get into prayer, you get into the Word, I guarantee you Satan will take off. He doesn't like it. He doesn't like me for saying it. So you can pray for me because we'll go head on and I know it, but he's going to lose every time because I have Yeshua Jesus. I have victory. Okay? Verse 7, back in Genesis 3. Then the eyes of both of them were opened. They knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves, you may have aprons or loin coverings, some sort of word like that. 
the eyes were open. What did that mean? Were they like puppies that are born that have their eyes closed and seven to ten days later the eyes are opened or like kittens? No. Their eyes physically were open. They saw the tree. Remember they lusted after the fruit. They saw it with their eyes. But what is meaning is that their eyes were now open to no evil. They knew <coughs> evil and they didn't have the power to avoid it. They fell right into the trap of evil. Man is no longer innocent now. Until this point he was. Now he knows the difference between good and evil. But rather than the glory of becoming a god like, they, like Satan told them, now they have an awful sense of shame. Shame is what enveloped them. They didn't become like God and wow, everything's wonderful. No, it is the exact opposite. And that's Satan. He lies to this day. He tells those living in foreign <clears throat> countries that if you become a martyr, you're going to go to, straight to heaven and for the men, you're going to have 72 virgins. And where do they wake up when they've given their life? In the flames of hell. I mean, th th that's horrible. But that's, that's Satan. He lies and he lies... He's the father of all lies, John 8, 44, Yochanan 8, 44. But they fell into his trap. Their eyes are now open. They know shame, and it says they knew, okay, that it became active. They have an active conscience now. And that's going to be the, the basis of what we call the second dispensation. Remember, dispensation is <coughs> a period of time that God had sets down certain rules, certain laws, certain what they are to be obedient to. They're given a time to prove their obedience or disobedience to it. When they fail, because they fail every time, there is some sort of a consequence. There is a judgment. But then God brings them into a new ruling. We see that seven different times in Scripture. Right now we're just on the second one. We will only see into the third in Genesis. Yeah. No, 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 no. We get into the fourth one. We get, we get from human government to law. Um, we don't get into the age of grace in Genesis. We'll see and, and talk about it, but it's not the time period. But right now they're going to go into that second one, and we call it the dispensation of conscience. First was innocence. They were innocent. Now they have a conscience. That conscience is letting them know there's good and there's evil. There's good, you know, right and wrong, and they should govern themselves accordingly. Should is the key word. The conscience teaches man that there's a moral law that they should be morally responsible. They should be obedient to that law. But here's your problem. Conscience is not going to bring us to God. Instead, what do we see it did to Adam and Eve? Shame, reproach, remorse, I'm sure, anguish. They're going to even hide from God, or at least attempt. We're going to see that this is their reaction, and they try to cover up their sin. They're trying to do everything they can because their conscience is telling them, you did something wrong. Now, that in itself, right there, says that we have a personal creator who is his handiwork who has made us. Because man who's supposed to evolve into something better and better and better in the story of evolution Man would never make for himself an accuser, a judge, a tormentor in his own mind, in his own heart. That wouldn't be. He, he would not choose that for himself. He would choose for it to all be glory and all be wonderful and all be better. So that conscience that we are in, that we have, that each of us have, that shows us God's handiwork. We don't see that in the animals, in the birds, in the fish, in the oceans, but the ones who are made in God's image, we do see that that conscience is literally a God consciousness. Because if we didn't know that there's a moral law, we wouldn't know there's a God. That because there is a God, there is moral law, and that is what he has brought to us. And again, I... I don't see any way that, that God created that in us. It's not something that would come out of an evolutionary procedure of time. Well, what were they aware of? What did they see? What were their eyes open to and their reaction to it? Uh, the first thing that, that we read after their eyes were open is that they knew they were naked. 
Now, this is a question, okay? Was there some sort of a glory light around them that had now disappeared? Something had to have been different for them to suddenly see themselves as naked. We know that something was different externally or they wouldn't have been afraid that God would know that they ate the fruit. They could think, well, I'll hide from God that I did that. I won't confess it to him. I won't tell him. What he doesn't know won't hurt me. But they don't even go there. They go immediately to, we need to hide. God's going to know we did it. How would God know if they couldn't externally see something was wrong and they couldn't hide what was wrong from him? Now remember, mankind was made in God's image. We've talked about God's glory. We've talked about the Shekhinah glory of God that represents God. The children of Israel saw it in the pillar, the cloud by day and the, the fire by night. We see it in the burning bush that didn't burn up. We see it in Yeshua himself when he was transfigured, when he suddenly put on, well, let's look at that. Let's look at Matthew 17 too because that gives us a hint and there's another scripture also that maybe I should have given you first, but I said Matthew 17 too, so we'll go there first. And this is when he was transfigured. Uh, it, the he in verse 2 is Yeshua Jesus was transfigured before Peter, James, and John. Verse 1 tells us that. His face shone like the sun. He's being seen in all his glory, not in his humanity. They got a glimpse of the risen, the glorious Yeshua that is the light of heaven. Remember, there's no sun and there's no night in heaven because the Lord is the light of heaven. And you can't hide that light. Okay, well here they got a glimpse. He was transfigured before him, his face shone like the sun, and his garments became as white as light. Notice that phrase, the garments became as white as light, as if the garment was light, the light clothed him. We see that idea in Psalm, Tehillim, Psalm 104 and verse 2. Psalm 104 and verse 2. Remember, I like things out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, let a thing be established. In verse 1 of Psalm 104, David, David is crying out, Bless the Lord of my soul. Oh Lord my God, you're very great. You are clothed with splendor and majesty. He sees God clothed with splendor, glory, majesty. He's not saying, Wow, I see that. That's a great looking suit on you, God. He's seeing him clothed in a different way. And verse 2 says, Covering yourself with light as with a cloak. Okay, so that he was clothed with light like a cloak. So it is a good thought, a, a, a great possible, I, I'm trying to think of a word better. Let's go with probable, that when he made Adam and Eve in his image, they had some sort of a light emanating from them also. And when they imbibed in the sin, that covering was now gone because they've broken the the commandment with God the obedience with God the relationship with God has now been broken so it makes sense that that's what it's being and if they were clothed in his light and now there's a loss of that light they see themselves and they felt exposed they felt naked now, naked also in scripture does speak about spiritual depravity. Look at Revelation 16. Revelation 16, and we'll look at um, verse 15. Revelation 16, 15 says, Behold, I am coming like a thief. This is God speaking, or the Lord speaking. Blessed is the one who stays awake and keeps his clothes, so that he will not walk about naked, and men will not see his shame. When you study it in context, you realize God's not saying, don't ever take your clothes off, don't get in the shower, and don't go to bed. He's saying that you don't want to be caught not spiritually clothed. You need to be clothed in his spiritual cloak. And we see that also in chapter 3 of Revelation, chapter 3 and verse 18, where we read there, and this is speaking to that weak church, the church of Laodicea, which thinks they're so great, thinks they're, they're rich, 
thinks they have great eyesight and thinks that they are clothed. And verse 18 says, I advise you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you might become rich and white garments so that you may clothe yourself and that the shame of your nakedness will not be revealed. Well, is he calling them out because he's saying it's the emperor's new clothes, you're walking around in nakedness? No, he's calling them out spiritually. You think that you're right with God. You think that everything's so great. And I'm telling you, you're not clothed spiritually. You need to have your eyes open to that. You need to be aware. So clothing and nakedness is used as spiritual and lack of, as a depravity or as what we have gained. We know that we gain when we come into salvation the robe of righteousness, that the Lord puts his robe on us. Have we, did we, are we losing them or just the picture, Roger? They went away and came back. Everybody there? Okay, okay. Sorry, I get nervous when you all disappear. <laughs> okay, so, oh, there they go again. I'm going to keep talking. If we do find out you freeze or something, hang in there, we'll try to come back. It's the cable probably because they're here online. Oh, okay, while you're okay. It just disappears here once in a while. Just trying to figure that part out. I'm being told apparently it's the cable feed to my screen. So. Maybe that's the light going out, and now you're in the light. <laughs> you're all clothed, yay. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, again, what we see, um, and especially because they try to clothe themselves, we see that we're, we're not just talking about a, a physical. We're talking about the spiritual depravity that they felt and they saw. So what do they do about it? Let's go back to Genesis 3, and we'll see that, that they try to take matters into their own hands so often what do we do when we've sinned oh let me clean up my own sin and what do we do we make it worse okay verse uh we're still in verse seven they knew that they were naked they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves these loin cover coverings this was man's first attempt at his own device i'll take care of my sin i'll do something to remedy it he's going to try to figure it out by himself and that's still the way of human religion. It's the way of works, the way of self-righteousness, the way of wanting to be clothed in God's sight, but it's not saying, God, you clothe me. It's saying, I'll do it. I'll clean myself up. I'll make myself better. And it's that pride. Yeshaya, Isaiah 64, verse 6 tells us, our righteousness in God's sight, our best when we're the cleanest and the, the, the most sparkly and we think that we've got it all, well, he says that's equal to filthy rags. Wow. Filthy rags. That's our best. We have nothing we can give God to say, look at me, I'm clothed okay. We are naked before our God and we need his robe of righteousness, which he does make for us. Look at Isaiah, Yeshaya, Isaiah 61 and verse 10. Isaiah 61 and verse 10. And I, for one, am very thankful it's dependent on God and not me. Okay, 61, 10. Although I have to humble myself before him and come to him in the way he says. <clears throat> 61, 10. I will rejoice greatly in the Lord. My soul will exalt in my God, for he has clothed me with garments of salvation. He has wrapped me with a robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decks himself with a garland, as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. Again, we get all gussied up on our wedding day. We want to be the most beautiful, and we want to be presented to the one we love, looking glorious. And he's saying, God, you did it all. You made me glorious. You made me as beautiful as a bride, as, as decked out as the bridegroom. That's what he is saying in Isaiah 61. But look, it's the Lord who does it. And it's he alone. Romans 10. Romans 10. You see it in, in the original covenant. You see it in the Berachah, the new covenant. Verses 2 to 4. For I testify, Paul's speaking here, I testify about them. They have a zeal for God. You may know someone who really wants to please God, but they're doing it all themselves. I could call out a couple of cults just <coughs> like this, that these cults, these people are good, hard, moral workers. They're doing all they can because they want to earn their way into God's pleasure. They want to make their way to heaven. They want to clothe themselves in their righteousness. And that's what Paul's calling out here, that, that um, 
They have a zeal for God, but not in accordance with knowledge, not according to the word of God, for not knowing about God's righteousness, seeking to establish their own, they did not subject themselves to the righteousness of God. For Messiah, Christ, is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. That law that calls you out, that lets you know that you're a sinner, it points you to Christ. He's the end. You have to put on his robe of righteousness, which he actually, he clothes you in when you open your heart to him. It's not anything that you're going to do on your own. Fig leaves cannot cover your sin. Back to verse 7 in Genesis 3, the fig leaves could not cover what Adam and Eve had done. It's very interesting just for a thought. That's all I'll say about it at this point. But the fig tree is the only thing that Messiah cursed when he was on the earth. <laughs> just interesting, okay? Um, what it showed, though, is um, man's trying to hide his spiritual shame. And he's directly under the curse. He can't bear fruit, and he can't do anything to rescue himself. He is doomed to wither away and die. The wages of sin is death. There's no other room for anything else. That's Romans 6, 23, but it, thankfully it goes on and says, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Matthew 21, verses 18 and 19. Matthew 21, verses 18 and 19. <clears throat> Now in the morning, when he was returning to the city, Yeshua Jesus, he became hungry. Seeing a lone fig tree by the road, he came to it and found nothing on it except leaves only. And he said to it, No longer shall there ever be any fruit from you. And at once the fig tree withered. That's what I, I'm talking about when I say that he cursed the fig tree. The fig tree had leaves. Because it had leaves, it was expected that it had fruit, the early fruit. When Yeshua went to get the early fruit and there was nothing, it was a facade. It was a fig. It's like what Adam and Eve are trying to do. I'll cover up that something's wrong. And Yeshua is showing that there is no covering and calling it out. That's what we're seeing. So let's see what happens when uh, God comes to uh, be with them in the garden. And I close Genesis by accident. Michelle, yes. It's like when people go to church and they're not saved, but they go to church thinking they are. Yes, same idea. And I thought I'd say that earlier, but in case you, I didn't make it clear, people who think, oh, well, I, I go to church, so I'm saved. That's my covering. You know, they're going to stand before God and say, well, I went to church every Sunday. I even went when I didn't feel good, God. And I went when my friends went to the beach. I gave you every Sunday. But you didn't come to him for him to put his clothing on you. You came in your own works. We'll see very quickly on when we, when we get to Adam and Eve's kids, we're going to see the same thought there. One tries to appease God by his own work, work of his hands versus the other who gave the way that God said, this is how you're to do it. Remember, God gets to call the shots. He created, he put man there, he gets to say what has to happen, whether we like it or not. You know, and that's what Satan didn't like. He wanted to be the shot caller. He wanted to be God. Look where it's getting him. And he, in the very presence of God, in the heavens, he knows better than we what all he's lost. But I don't pity him. He does not deserve any pity. Verse 8, they've tried to put these fig leaves on to cover their nakedness, and they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. Before we go any farther, let's just stop right there. They heard, they heard the sound. Some of your scriptures may say they heard the voice. Okay, well the Hebrew gives us idea they heard the sound. Now, remember we know God to be a spirit. We know Yeshua Jesus to be in human flesh. So what we have to see is there was some sort of difference here in the garden because Yeshua has not been born in human flesh yet, and yet God comes and walks in the cool of the evening with them. That says to me that he clothed himself in some way that they could relate, they could identify. And I think that because of the way the, the phrasing is, this was a common Occurrence. I think it happened every day in the cool of the day. Uh, did I read that far? I did. The walking in the garden in the cool of the day. I think every day in the cool of the day, God was fellowshipping with them. That should have kept them from falling. 
they should have run into this one who was there for them. But instead, remember, they resisted his will and his way. But somehow they heard sound. Whether God put on the, the human form as much as, you know, this was a pre, was called a theophany or Christophany, where God put himself into the, the human form, or not, I cannot say exactly, but we all know, you can hear somebody approaching, you can hear somebody walking before they come into to your very presence. So, in some way, they heard the Lord coming. If this was a common occurrence, like I believe it is, they knew it was coming. Remember, they were concerned God was going to see their nakedness. So God wasn't a distant God far away, and they didn't know how to relate to him. No, he was personal up front with them. And when it says in the cool of the day, it literally means in the breeze or in the wind. Um, the ruach is the same word. When we say ruach hakodesh, we're saying Holy Spirit. The same word is used, and uh, it's not that... that wind is God, I'm not saying that, but just as the wind moves and we see, we don't see God, but we see him move and we see the results. And what, what I'm pointing out in this, God in spirit fellowshiped with his human creation that he made body, soul, and spirit. He made them in a way that they could have that fellowship with him, and before the fall he did fellowship with them. So, they hid themselves. They weren't satisfied with the fig leaves. It wasn't good enough. It wasn't covering well enough for their conscience to not feel that shame, or they wouldn't have been afraid. Look with me at 1st Yochanan, 1st John. One of those three little books almost at the end of your Bible. 1st John chapter 3, verses 20 and 21. And in 1st John 3, 20, we read, in whatever our heart condemns us, for God is greater than our heart, knows all things. Beloved, if your heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. What were Adam and Eve lacking? Confidence before God. Why? Because our heart was condemning them. They knew they had done wrong. This is the first effect of the conscience. And the first effect makes us cower, makes us fearful before God. But there's a remedy, and I love it. Remember, God's not caught by surprise, and now he's got to figure out what to do. God had a plan. Go to the very next chapter, chapter 4 in 1 John. Go to verse 18. 1 John 4 and verse 18 says, There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out all fear, because fear involves punishment, and the one who fears is not perfected in love. What's that saying to us? When they had fear, it's because they weren't now walking in the love of God. When you are in God's love, your fears will be cast away. He will fill you with perfect peace. He, you will know his undying love for you. But they did not know this, although God did have a plan for them, and he's going to reveal it to them. But notice that rather than seeking God openly, rather than coming to God and confessing, we blew it. We're guilty. We did something wrong and, and asking for forgiveness. Instead, they attempted to conceal it from God and then attempted to cover it up for themselves. Does that sound true today? Oh, I'll, I'll just hide it. I'll just hide it. That's what too often is done. Back to verse 9. Genesis 3, back to verse 9. Then the Lord God called to the man and said to him, where are you? Now, did God not know? Were they doing a good job? Were they hiding behind a tree? You know, the garden's full of plenty of trees. Was God having to look for them? And that garden was large. Mm -hmm. Adam, where are you? <laughs> yeah, I'm hiding. <laughs> No, <laughs> the idea behind it, what I think God wants us to glean from this, is he was seeking them out. He still loved them, and he still loves us when we've made a mistake and when we need his, his forgiveness. I mean, in essence, your sins are forgiven. We know that, but we need to confess it. We need to confess, I am sorry. 
I don't want to do this again. Help me not to. We need to just open up that communication line and we can do it on faith, knowing we have a God that loves the sinner. That God didn't say, okay, gone out. <laughs> and he didn't condemn him when he did see him. He did let him know there's consequences. Here's the judgment. But in that judgment, oh, we'll wait till you see what God says. Wow. I mean, and this is our first in introduction to it in Scripture. So when we know the end of the story and when we know that we've seen it time and time and time again through Scripture, remember they're back at the very beginning. And wow, I mean, what he, what he reveals. Before we get there, though, let me show you. This is our God. Luke 19 and verse 10. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. That was said of Yeshua when he walked on this earth has been true. God, throughout time, he's seeking and, sa seeking and willing to save the lost. They just have to let him. Verse 10, back in Genesis 3. I've got to get back there, sorry. Verse 10. Um, he's called out to Adam, where are you? <clears throat> and Adam's one who answers, he's the he in verse 10. He said, I heard the sound of you in the garden. And I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid myself. Okay, he knew. It's all over. I can't hide it from God. He's here. The cool evening has come. He's here. There's something very different about me. I think outwardly in some way it had to have shown. Inwardly, he has a sense of guilt. He's tried to bluff his way. He's done the best he could to cover himself. And it's all over. When sinners stand before God, they're going to know there's absolutely no way that they can cover their guilt. There is no excuse, there is nothing good enough that will enable them to stand before God. Yet look at Revelation 6, um, yeah, Revelation chapter 6, verses 15 and 16. This gives us where man goes, man's reaction. Chapter 6 of Revelation, verse 15 and 16, they're in the midst of what has been the, the sixth seal. Uh, it's terror that's rolling out on uh, on the face of the earth and it says in verse 15 and the kings of the earth the great men the commanders the rich the strong every slave and free man they hid themselves in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains and they said to the mountains and the rocks fall on us hide us from the presence of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb even in the middle of, of all that's going on they still don't humble themselves before God they're saying, hide us mountains, hide us, and the, what else was it, the mountains and the rocks. And they, they don't turn to God even then. The sinner, unfortunately, who does not turn to God, will stand before God with his mouth, nothing to say. Rhonda, unmute yourself, and we'll get your question or comment. And can you help her? Still trying? There you go. Okay. So is it safe to say that we start off having or were initially clothed in righteousness? Was that what they? They were. Adam and Eve were initially clothed in God's glory, His righteousness in some way, um, something that reflected that. But the, that they lost that when they sinned. Because we come from them, sin entered into the human race, we don't even start out clothed in righteousness. Look at the little, little one. <laughs> they show that they're not sinless <laughs> very early on. <laughs> they show it by attitude. <laughs> they show it in all kinds of ways very early on. Well, it isn't because they were taught at that young age to be ornery and to be self-seeking and, and all of that. It's because they're born with it. And if you don't know, I can give you all kinds of examples, but I'll tell you, just watch any young little infant. Well, let's go a little past infant. Toddler. Even, even before toddler. Okay, my little grandniece, who is adorable. <laughs> 
at about eight months, nine months, her, her mommy and daddy had gotten her a little toy and put it down by, by her for her enjoyment. And in a moment of attitude, she backhanded that thing across the room and was like, no, get that thing out of here. Now, I'm not saying, oh, what a terrible sinner, but she's showing, I want things my way. And how about the little ones that very early on really holler when they don't get their will, when something's taken from them, when they don't get that meal, when they think they should get that meal. I'm not going to say anything about the grown-ups here. <laughs> we can all read between the lines. But what I'm saying is we're born that way. It doesn't take long to see in a very young, in, in one who is less than a year even, we see they have that sin nature. So we're not born in that glory covering at, um, at the time of our birth because sin comes through the bloodline. We're all born through that bloodline. Now, let me just clarify very quickly. That does not mean that a baby who dies or a young toddler who dies because they didn't have the robe of righteousness that they're condemned. God says that there's an age of accountability, and it's different for every single person. Some at a very early age understand right and wrong and that they need forgiveness for sin, and at that age, they're accountable. Some don't understand that for a number of years more than others. God alone knows where that understanding comes. But any who die under that age, before they've come to the ability to be able to reason, to know right and wrong, to know the consequence of right and wrong, they, they are then uh, covered by the blood of Yeshua, and they go right into the presence of the Lord. Where do I get that scripturally? David, David, sinned a great sin. He got somebody else's wife pregnant. Kills off her husband trying to cover it up. He comes under condemnation. The prophet comes and says, God's calling you out on this. David knows he's guilty. The sentence of judgment that, that's come down is he's been told that this baby that came out of that relationship is not going to live. The baby will die. David pleads before the Lord. He doesn't want his baby to die. He's crying. He's mourning. He's, he's doing everything to try to... Uh, get God's forgiveness in this, to get an escape from the, the judgment that comes. Well, the baby dies. His men were afraid he was such a basket case before the baby died. They were afraid to let him know the baby had died because they thought he'll go over the edge. That'll be it. And instead, when he gets word that the baby has died, he takes off his morning clothes, he washes his face, he cleans himself up, and he says he wants to eat. And his servants are looking at him like, Okay, we don't get that. Why now that the baby's died, are you not mourning? And before the baby died, you were mourning. What gives? And David gives that great verse of comfort for us. He said, I know that my baby is not going to come back down from heaven to earth. That doesn't happen. But I know one day I will be with my baby. I will go to where my baby is. That tells us that baby under the blood of Yeshua Jesus is protected. That also fits with who we know our God is. God is not one out to condemn anyone who he can. He's out to save everyone who he can. So those who die early, they're in heaven. If you've lost a baby in vitro, that baby is in heaven. There's the argument of, well, what stage are they in? And all I'll say to you is, I guarantee you, there's no infants that need to be bottle-fed and taken care of in heaven. In some way, God brings them into the fullness of who they would have been. And nothing in Scripture tells us what age we are in heaven. I'm trying to hit off the questions that will come. Um, nothing tells us that. There are theories out there. If you want to know the theories, you can ask me later. But uh, at this point, I think just suffice it to say, I think God likes variety. Some think he likes everything the same. We'll find out. We'll find out. But all I know is I'm going to be the me I was supposed to be when I'm home in heaven. And I'm not going to decay. 
<laughs> I'm not going to wither up. I'm not going to have any issues anymore forever. And as my mom aged, I heard her say more often and more often, I can't wait to get my new body. <laughs> it's glorious. However it is, it's glorious. Okay, so back on track. Um, I keep looking. If you wonder, I keep looking. And Lena, don't do anything about it. But you've got something on your wall in the background. And when I glance, I think it's a hand going up. <laughs> so just, just in case you're wondering what, where my attention's going. That's the, the, the problem. But back to, are we, where are we? Okay, so Adam's talking with God. He has told God that I was afraid. I was naked. I hid myself. Verse 11, and God, he said, God is, that he is God. God said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? Hmm. Once again, I ask you the question. Did God not know? Why did God ask? He wanted them to admit it. Very good. Dory, you get A pluses all the way today. He wanted Adam to admit it, confess it. He wanted him to talk with him about it. The man said, Yes, God, I did it. I did the dastardly deed. I was wrong. I'm sorry. Is that what your Bible says? <laughs> no, no. He immediately does what is just still common to this day. The man said, The woman whom you gave to, it to me to be with me, she gave me from the tree and I ate it. What's he saying? The woman made me do it. <laughs> okay? He blames somebody else. No will of he, his own. No, yep, not, no will of his own, no responsibility of his own. And do you notice who really gets blamed in that? Hear the phrase again. Let me read it for you again. The woman whom you gave me. Oh, blames God. Blames God. Hey, God, you gave her to me. <laughs> he really blames God more That's than really the God. woman. <laughs> wow. That is over here shaking your head like, you don't do that. No, you don't. And God in his love didn't do what Patty's thinking God should have done. Oh, yeah? <laughs> well, let me tell you a thing or two. But God in his love is working with his creation. And so we go on with our story. The man's blamed the woman. She ate it. Then the Lord God turned to the woman. What is it that you've done? Okay, he goes along with Adam at this point. Doesn't say, hey, don't blame me. He just says, okay, woman, what have you done? And the woman does the same thing. Does she stop and say, Lord, I'm sorry. I broke your law. I confess it to you. No, her immediate re response is, the serpent, he deceived me and I ate. It's the serpent's fault. I was deceived and so I ate. They both pass the buck. They both don't accept the blame for themselves. And now we come to the next point, which is very interesting. I want to see if I remember to tell you everything. Um, okay, I think I did. I think I did. I'd moved my notes before. I only have one verse and I can't remember why. Let's look real quick at 1 Timothy 2.14 because I put it down. So there's got to be a reason. So 1 Timothy 2.14. And then we'll see how God handles his wayward children. 1 Timothy 2 and verse 14 we have... And it was not, oh, uh, just proving that Adam was not deceived. It was not Adam who was deceived, but the woman being deceived fell into transgression. So she answered right. She was deceived by the serpent, but she answers wrong when she says it's his fault. You know, I'm blaming him, okay? But she told truth. She was deceived. Adam couldn't even say that because Adam was not deceived. Eyes wide open did what he did. Okay, now with that in mind, now we look and we see what God does, okay? He turned to Adam. Adam blamed Eve. He turned to Eve. Eve blamed the serpent. So does he turn to the serpent and ask the same question? Does he say, what did you do? No, he doesn't. He does not question Satan. He knew that Satan is nothing but a liar. He knew that Satan deserved nothing but a pronounced sentence of judgment because there is no grace for Satan. There is no mercy. There is no second chance here, so to speak. And he immediately 
um, gives sentence. What's the word? Passes judgment. Passes sentence on the serpent. The Lord God said to the serpent, verse 14, because, and this is Adonai, this is the Lord that makes covenant with his man, this is Elohim, God, the, the strong one, the mighty, the powerful, the creator of the universe. This one said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you more than all the cattle, more than every beast of the field. You know, he's come in that form of the serpent. The serpent is one of the beasts of the field. He's saying, you're cursed more than all the cattle, more than every beast of the field. On your belly you will go, and dust you will eat all the days of your life. Okay, he pronounces a curse on Satan before he ever gives the, the uh, picture of redemption to mankind, to, to Adam and Eve. Uh, again, because there's no redemption for Satan. The redemption for Adam and Eve we're going to see in verse 15, but we're not quite there yet. Um, what we're seeing for Satan in the form of this serpent that he's taken on is a final and irrevocable curse. Look at Isaiah, Yeshia, Isaiah 65, verse 25. <clears throat> God did not take lightly what Satan did. He, he's, this judgment is harsh, but it's right, it's just, it's fair, and, and it's true. It wasn't anger that, that God had to back off of later. No, this was deserving. Uh, Isaiah 65 and verse 25, we read there, The wolf and the lamb will graze together. Now, if you read it in the context to explain it, we know that Isaiah 65 is giving us a picture of the millennial reign. When the Lord is on this earth, ruling from Jerusalem, and the whole earth knows peace. Not only will the, the uh, weapons of war be made into plowshares, so they'll plow fields with them instead of fighting war with each other, but we see the animal kingdom is also at peace during the thousand year reign. So the wolf and the lamb are going to eat together. They're going to lie down together. And as my mom would say, and I hear her, and the lamb won't be lying in the wolf's stomach, <laughs> okay? <laughs> They'll be lying side by side. They'll be getting along. Notice the next phrase, and dust will be the serpent's food. That's still going to be the serpent's food when the other animals are released from the curse of sin, and we're going to see the animal life also is judged under the, this curse, and we'll talk about why, but we're going to see even at that time, the serpent is not released from that judgment. It's irrevocable. We don't ever read about it being different for the serpent. Dust or dry earth will be his food. When it says on your belly, back in Genesis 3, on your belly you will go, apparently the serpent did walk. Apparently the serpent was upright. He didn't just slither on the ground. And believe me, he didn't come in slithering and the forked tongue going out and you know, looking like something evil. He came in looking like something wonderful. And being upright would have been um, showing, it. again, it sounds like he was, the serpent was one of the higher forms of the beasts in the field, one of the more, um, can I say, lovely? I think you get the idea. It had a beauty that I think outshined a lot of the other beasts, I, I think. I can't tell you for a fact, but it sounds like it. So this curse is going to be a perpetual reminder always of the man to man of the instrument of his fall. The serpent was used by Satan to bring this fall and Satan is headed for a final destruction himself. So we never see the serpent redeemed in any shape or form. Cursed above all of the earth. Remember, and this is a little ways back for us, but remember verse 1? Now the serpent was the more crafty than any beast of the field. So again, I get the idea the serpent had the edge, you know, was the top. We know man was God's greatest creation, but out of the animals, it sounds like that, that was that serpent. And so again, his, his beauty, his craftiness, everything that was desirable about him is now under that curse. And he now becomes an object of dread and of loathing. And we see that. There are those who like snakes, I know that, but a good majority of people, and especially in the, the female line, the snake is not something that they want to cuddle up to. It's not something beautiful to them. 
And I know that I've seen the pictures of these snakes that, that people do say, oh wow, look at the beauty of, of you know, the design. And I can say, okay, I see what you say, but I just still kind of tell you, it gives me the creeps. <laughs> it's not something that I can say, wow, God, I'm going to glorify you in the beauty of this creation. There's a few who can, and that's between them and God. But you don't want a boa. I do not want to go wrapped around me, no. No, I have no desire to. And I think I've told you the stories before, you know, when I taught school, I did not let the little boy bring his pet snake to school. Even though he promised it would stay in the tank, I knew if that lid came off, we all have a problem. <laughs> because teacher would not be rescuing. <laughs> so, just where I'm at, when God put it between the women and the serpent, it comes right down here, okay? We'll talk more about that when we get there, though. The eating the dust, okay? Um, chapter 1 and verse 30 shows us in Genesis. Am I there? Yeah. Chapter 1 and verse 30 shows us what they were eating, okay? Uh, this is back in when God has created all. To every beast of the earth, to every bird of the sky, to everything that moves on the earth, which has life, I have given every green plant for food. And yes. it was so. No so, the, right, no meat, but the serpent ate the herbs, ate the green, you know, whatever that green vegetation was, the serpent participated in that. Now, the serpent's diet's not even going to be that. Now, it doesn't mean that the serpent literally eats dust and that's all they eat, and I do think the expression, eat dust, comes oh. out of this. <laughs> But the idea is what they eat will be in the dust, right in front of them, no glory to it. We know they eat the creepy things that are on the, the ground crawling. It, it's all just disgusting and revolting. There's not any beauty in what he eats. There's not any beauty in his appearance. There's not any beauty in the way that he gets around because someone will say, oh yeah, he can slither here and he can slither there. Yeah, but can he get up and run away from an enemy? Can he get in a car and drive somewhere? No, he's not on a level that we're on, you know, and, and many more ways than just the two I said. But what I want you to see here is it was a graphic figure of speech. It was to indicate a humiliating judgment. All Satan has wanted is pride. I'm lifted up. Look at me. Worship me. Glorify me. Instead, he's being put all the way down to the earth, slithers in the dust, on his belly forever, eating dust forever. There's no glory in that. There's no, and, and it's not going to change, okay? Total defeat, total defeat. Even in the millennium, Isaiah 65, 25, we read that all the days of your life. That's what his judgment is going to be. Micah, Micah, chapter 7 and verse 17 also. Again, I'm more than one witness for you. Micah. Chapter 7 and verse 17. Here we read verse 17, chapter 7. They will lick the dust like a serpent, like reptiles of the earth. They will come trembling out of their fortresses. To the Lord our God they will come in dread and they will be afraid before you. See how it's still saying it and showing they're, they're going to be fearful, they're going to live in dread, there's nothing beautiful about them. Satan, always trying to reach for victory, ends up falling short and ending in defeat. He's never going to succeed. He didn't succeed as an angel in heaven. He didn't succeed um, in here when he, on earth when he came after Adam and Eve to regain. Yes, he regained authority here on earth for a time, but the serpent being a picture of him shows his ultimate and complete defeat. And we know that, that Satan eventually will end up in the lake of fire and it will be all over for him as far as inflicting anything on any of, of God's creation ever again. Okay? Um, Dora, did you have a question? No, I'm sorry. Did somebody... Ro uh, Rowena? Yeah, um, so it's a picture like Satan entered the serpent's body and used him, like possessed him? Yes. Yes. Say that again. Okay. The serpent entered, like entered into the, the, I'm sorry, Satan, Satan, entered into the serpent's body and used the serpent. Yes. Okay. In, in that sense. Because Satan didn't, he, he was a cherub. He was beautiful until pride was found in him. He gets judged, 
but he didn't, you know, everybody pictures the devil, pitchfork, tail, you know, the horns. No, no, he didn't become like that. He still disguises himself as an angel of light, even when he's trying to fool people. So, yes, he must have in some way use the serpent, the most crafty, the most apparently one of the most beautiful God's beasts to indwell that body in some way and that it fell under this curse forever. You, and if you want to say poor snake, we'll take that up with God and, and poor all of the creation because everything, all the animals, suffered the consequence of sin. We're going to, but that's right where I'm at when we're going to look and see that all the animals are brought under the curse of sin also. The animals decay, they die, they suffer, they have pain. We're going to see that it gets worse, animals attacking animals. You know, they're, they're under the same and the thing snakes also. Get eaten. And the snakes get eaten. <laughs> when I was thinking like um, in the millennium, God did not really eradicate the serpents because they were still there, but the curse was still there probably to remind us exactly. of how it all began. Exactly. You know? The only correction I'll give to your sentence, you're perfect and you're right on, but we, us, we're coming in our resurrected bodies back with the Lord. We're no longer in any position where Satan and his evil can touch us. So instead of saying us, those alive in the millennium in their physical bodies are the ones that, yes, this was a permanent picture to remind them, look at, look at this and the great cost of sin, the great cost of stepping out of line, the great cost of, of being filled with that pride. Because what does Satan do when he's let loose after that millennium for a thousand years? He goes through again, deceiving all who he can, but he's bringing them all up. Hey, follow me. We're going to go take out the head guy. We're going to take out God. We're going to be in his place. And if you follow me, you come along with me, you help me, I, I guarantee you, you'll be in a good place. I'll, I'll make it worth your while. You can imagine what he's saying. So there's still a period of time where, where humankind in their physical bodies, that's not us, we're in our resurrected bodies. We have the body that we will live in eternally, flesh and bone, no blood. The life of the flesh now is in the blood, then it's not. We won't be subjected to this, but those people born during the millennium who have to show their allegiance to God or to the enemy, they're the ones he's going to go after. So yes, Satan is, is still, he's not allowed to work on the earth during the, the millennium. He's He's um, chained in the abyss, Revelation 20, verses 1 through 3, but then he's let loose. But that picture on the earth of that snake that's, that's just, there's no glory in it, that will be a reminder of what took place, how it all started, and encourage them, you don't want to follow that. You don't want to go in that direction. Um, let me show you, and I think, I'm not sure if there was another question. I'm not seeing a hand. If there is, raise it again in a minute. But let me show you all of creation fell under this curse also. That wasn't just Adam and Eve. I'm tripping myself. Romans 8. See, I need my perfected body. <laughs> Romans 8, verses 20 to 22. For the creation was subjected to futility. Futility is futile. It's going to corrupt. It's going to die. It's going to decay. There's no hope. There's no redemption in futility. So knowing what that word means now, we go back and we read in verse 20, the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself also will be set free from its slavery to corruption into the freedom and the glory of the children of God. What it's saying is all creation got judged. Adam's kingdom got judged along with Adam. It's all futile. Every bit, every animal, every bird, every flying, I guess the birds fly, fishies in the sea, okay? All of them are under this curse. They're all going to die. As soon as you're born, you're starting to die. That's the futility of it. But there is hope that the same way that mankind can be redeemed, can come into everlasting life 
in Yeshua Jesus that there's hope that the creation will be released from the chains of the judgment of sin also. And we know that that will be true. We get a glimpse of it in the millennium when the lion and the lamb are lying together and not eating each other. And as we go on into eternity, I think it only gets greater. I have no idea how because God makes the new heavens and a new earth. But God loves his creation. He loves the animals. He made them. He made them for our enjoyment. I have a feeling animals could talk before the fall. You notice Eve's not ever like, wow, the serpent can talk. This is amazing. We don't get anything like that. She just enters right into conversation with him. We know our animals communicate with us now in a confined way. We know that they can show their happiness. We've got one here that thumps that tail when, when you come in the room. She's so excited to see you. Thump, 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 thump. Yes, and you see it in their eyes. You see their whole little demeanor light up. She so adores her master, and that's <laughs> not me. Her master, it's Roger if you don't know, she adores him. And her whole world is alive when he walks in. And when he's gone, she's sad and she mopes. <laughs> she has those emotions and those feelings. She's communicating to us. But before the fall, I think she could have said to Roger, I love you. <laughs> I'm not saying it was English. I'm not telling you Adam spoke English. But I think there was a far greater communication, the ability that was there. The same way we see language confused at the Tower of Babel. And we will get there one day, I prophesy. <laughs> because I'll teach it up in heaven if the Lord lets me, if I don't get to down here on earth. But Genesis 11, when God brings judgment, he confounds the languages to get the people to go out like they were supposed to go. So again, you see, he, he takes away their language abilities in a form. And I think the greater happened to the animal kingdom at the same time. They all came under the curse. They came under the, the same physical elements, they're going to not live forever now. Um, the same thing that happened to man happened to the animals also. And again, that had to be. Number one, can you imagine if we still had the animals alive that were born in Adam's day? They would have taken over this earth by now. There'd be no space. But also, it's just a natural consequence because what happened in the earth that causes the decay of the body, the breakdown, how could it not happen to the animals who are eating the, the vegetation of the earth and all of that too? Everything suffered the consequences. Why? Because it was Adam's kingdom. He represented it. He was the head of it. He was to take care of it. Remember, he was to till the garden. He was to take care of the garden. So all of his responsibility that he let down suffers a consequence. We see that in our lives today. Now, I'm not going to go pick on you men that are in my class and say you're the head of the house and it's all up to you because we know it's a little different than that today. But if that head of the house doesn't work and bring home food, who suffers? Just the head of the house? No. His whole family suffers. Even the animal. And even the animals they don't suffer. Yeah, so we just see it's a natural fallout. Sin covered it all. And let's look at that. Let's look at the elements of, um, well, we're going to look at the elements of the covenant, of the dispensation of conscience now. But what we're first going to see is the curse that came on. Well, we'll just see it as we go in order. Rather than me telling you everything ahead, let's just go back and look, okay? So there's going to be elements. God is still going to enter into a covenant with his man. He's not, he hasn't crispy creamed him, made him a crispy fritter fryer or whatever I'm trying to say. He didn't get rid of him, okay? He's, he's broken his fellowship. He's broken uh, what he's lost. Oh, my word. If you don't think that Adam paid a price, he alone knows what it was like prior. If we know how bad it is after, can you imagine knowing what you lost? Can you imagine, because I'm, I'm going ahead of the story, but you all know they're cast out of the garden. Can you imagine looking back at what they had, knowing how wonderful it was and the loss of it? I mean, he paid a huge price. But let's go back. Let's go in order. Let's get it from the scripture viewpoint, not Rochelle's. So um, they blamed each other. God 
ask each one, giving each one a chance to confess to him, each one to say they're sorry before him. They don't, but then he turns to Satan, doesn't even allow Satan a chance to say, I'm sorry, you know, I did wrong, because he knew he wouldn't. He knew he would just manufacture another lie, and he was worthy of nothing, uh, no kind of redemption, so he just hits him right away. So the serpent again, Satan's tool is cursed. We see that graphic warning, we see all of this in verse 14. Now it's going to be despised, it's going to be on its belly, it's going to eat dust, it's not going to have the beauty that, that's going, that apparently attracted it before. Then, now, right now, there it is before God meets out the judgment for Adam and the judgment for Eve on a very personal, upfront level. Adam representing man, Eve representing woman, this is what your consequences are going to be. Before he even meets that out, look what he does. He gives one of the greatest, well how can I say that? I was going to say one of the greatest verses in scripture, but they're all great. But one of the, the most healing to the heart, one of the most blessed promises for us comes right now. In Genesis 3 and verse 15, God promises the Redeemer. Right away, God says, before I pass sentence on you, I want you to know there's a way for you to be redeemed. And I say hallelujah, because if we had to just do nothing but suffer forever, we, would, we, we should be pitied. And for those who won't accept the redemption, they should be pitied, but because God made that redemption and they choose not to receive it, that's why we don't need to pity them. They have made a choice. You're either for the Lord or you are against the Lord. We talk about, oh, they're on the fence. No, they're not. If they're not for him, they're against him. They may be coming closer to the point that they're going to change, but they're still against him until they receive him. Nobody gets in because they live a good life, because they're in the middle. No. No, 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 no. But let's look at what God says, okay? It starts out, and remember, this is the first promise of a Redeemer. Um, and you know what? Because of time, let me give you a quick outline. Then we'll go back and we'll do verse by verse. But I'm afraid I, I lose some at 3.30, and if I go past, I want to make sure you get the whole thought here. So verse 15, we get the promise of the Redeemer. Verse 16 tells us the changed state for the woman. It's given in three particulars. Multiply conception pain and motherhood, and the headship of man. Sin's disorder means there's got to be this headship and this invested in man, but we're going to see God's drawing a bigger picture of the, the church family, that he is the head, and we are subjected under him, and when we're under him, everything is right and in order. We see in verse 17, the labor that's on the face of this earth, instead of just... Um, um, nurture the garden or just you know um, it was light duty and it was joyful duty now it's got thorns and thistles and it's the sweat of his brow and all of that that's seeing what what man's sentence was inevitably verses 17 18 show us the sorrow of life especially because the ground is cursed we're going to see how much that sorrow of life uh, yeah, the sorrow of life, because death is now here. That's what I'm trying to say. And verse 19 tells us the brevity of life, that there is certain physical death. There's no one on this earth who can say, I'll never die. The only ones who will not see physical death will be the ones who are raptured. If you are in that time when the rapture occurs, you will not see physical death. But we don't know who that is, who that belongs to. So no one can say, well, I know I'm not going to die. Those of us alive today because of world conditions, believing how close the rapture is, we've got great hope that we won't see death. And there's no reason not to have that hope. But there's no guarantee. Everybody's under that certain physical death. But again now, backing up, God meets out that judgment. But first, he gave hope. That's our God. That's our great God. Even when his personal creation blew it. Only one thing. Don't eat from one tree. And they still blew it. All we can see is God saying, I love you. I still love you. 
let me wait, make a way for you to come back to me. So now we go into verse 15. This is the first time we see the plan of redemption revealed. And I love it. I'm stealing this from Charles Spurgeon. He was a great uh, orator of the Word of God. He was a great preacher in time past. But I love the way he said it. He said it's the first gospel sermon delivered on the surface of the earth. Memorial, memor memorable, sorry, memorable indeed. With Jehovah himself for the preacher, the whole human race, and the prince of darkness for the audience. I love that. When God revealed his plan of redemption, he gives it in his clarity that it's for all of mankind, but he also makes it very clear at the same time, Satan has no part in this redemption. He brought mankind down and caused ma mankind's demise in this, he even has to sit there and see what God does to rescue man, what God didn't do to rescue him. Now, why? Did God love man more than he loves the angels that he created? No, I don't think that's what it is at all. I think because Satan, in the very presence of God, in a holy heaven, <coughs> came up with this pride, filled himself with himself and said, I will be the Most High. I will be worshipped. There was no excuse for that. There was nothing. Woman gets deceived. Man follows woman. They're down here on this earth, not in the very presence of God at the time that they did the deed, but Satan in the very presence of a holy God, in a perfect environment, and then some was filled with this this sin, this pride, and that's why I think he's judged greater. There is just no room for an excuse, no room at all. But God said, okay, mankind, you were not living in my heaven, in my presence, in my throne room with me. I will, in mercy, come into your form, a little lower than the angels, and I will be lifted up higher than angels and bring you home with me too. That's great love and it just shows Satan he's getting what he deserves. Again, I have no pity for Satan. I'm thrilled to death that God has mercy for us. So, verse 15 before I run out of time hopefully, I will put enmity. The root word of enmity is enemy. Okay, I'm, there's going to be an enemy here. What's the enemy between you? He's talking to the serpent. Remember verse 14? You're going to go on your belly, dust, you'll eat all the days of your life, and I will put enmity between you and the woman. Okay, Satan, Satan, he is our enemy. There's no other way to look at it. Look at Matthew 13, um, 38 and 39. Matthew 13. 38, <coughs> 38 and 39, where we read, And, excuse me, okay, and this was in a parable that he's now explaining what the symbols in the parable meant. The field is the world, and as for the good seed, these are the sons of the kingdom, and the terrors are the sons of the evil one. So we have, in the field, we have good workers who are working for the kingdom of God, and we have those who are working for Satan. Verse 39, and the enemy who sowed the, them, those bad seeds, is the devil. And the harvest is the end of the age. At the end of the age when there's a harvesting and the tares are cast out because you let the tares and the wheat grow up together because you can't tell what the difference is and then there's the separation. The end is going to come. The, the, if you keep reading, you will read that the tares are gathered up and they're burned in the fire. The wheat is spared. So what we're seeing right away is Satan is the devil. He's the one who sows the seeds. He's the evil one. He is our enemy. And it's upfront and personal because God says back here in Genesis 3.15 that there is enmity between... I lost my Bible. There we go. I lost my Bible. I got it back. Good thing it's in my heart. <laughs> Good thing I have a hard copy right behind me. <laughs> but verse 15, the enmity is between Satan 
and the woman. Now that doesn't mean it's not going to be with the man also. That Satan doesn't bother any men and leaves them off the hook. Are you kidding me? <laughs> no, but we're going to see this war between the two. Okay? Um, the you, the, the the between you, or if your old scripture says the, it's <coughs> representing Satan. Okay? Since the woman was to bear Earth's future <coughs> children, she had de demonstrated her control over the man. She got the man to eat the fruit at her suggestion. She was deceived, but she got him to willingly follow her. So Satan probably thought, she's going to have more <coughs> children. I'll be able to deceive them. I'll get more to be in my kingdom, and I'll get so many we can work against his kingdom. That probably was his thought, because he has the audacity to still think today that he can dethrone God. He still thinks he can thwart God's plan. He still thinks he can wipe the Jew off the face of the map so Messiah has no one to come back to, no land of, of Israel, and no nation to return to. That's still his intent, and he keeps trying and trying and trying. He's even trying in the Ukraine right now. They're wiping out the, the Jewish people also. They hit the Holocaust Memorial on purpose. That's a memorial of those who were killed because they were Jewish. What just happened again? Russia said, let's hit the Jews again. Okay, he's still trying to do it, and I'll tell you other times also, but you probably also know. It is also true, sadly, many of the false cults were started by women, that, that Satan does work through women, that he does deceive her in her mind still, and many times he gets the woman to be the tool to get to the man even, too. We see that. But he probably thought, Satan probably thought, he was going to be able to get this whole host that would be on his side doing his thing. They would be his allies. They would be, along with his host of evil angels who followed him when he, when he tried to sit himself on the throne in heaven, he probably thinks, well, I've got all these angels, I'll get all these humans, we'll still dethrone God. Because we see that attempt after the millennium. And again, his intent is to set himself up as ruler right now over this planet. He wants to be the ruler. He is the prince of the power of the air, but the battle is on. But God's curse is going to thwart his plan right there. The woman is not going to become his willing ally. She's not going to go along easily with him, nor is she going to be able to control her husband and, and get him to follow her. We see exceptions to the rule, but the rule overall, that isn't how it's happening. We know that. Not at all. You can't blame the women any more than the men today and say, well, it's their fault. No, no, we see it. And more importantly, God's going to tell them, and here comes the next phrase, not only is there enmity between you and the woman, but between your seed and her seed. Out of the woman would come the seed who is going to destroy Satan. Because that seed that's being referred to is Yeshua Jesus. That's not just that she's going to have children, but she's going to have the one of promise who will be able to remove the curse of sin and free them from, from Satan being their ruler, which he is right now in the air over us. So um, I think that, that we're seeing it on many levels. Um, spiritually, we see it, the age-old struggle all the way through, but we see the eventual destruction of Satan. And I haven't even really gotten you this whole verse yet. Um, I will run just a few minutes over trying to give you the rest of 15, and that's where we'll stop. Um, I'll probably hit it fast now and a little better later. So let me tell you here, women can have two meanings. It can have the one that I've given to you already, but it also can be that she is a, a speaking in type, where we have pictures, you know, teaching us spiritual lessons, that she is a type of Israel. Israel brings forth the male child, Christ, Messiah, who defeats Satan. In fact, I'll give you this because I want those who are here, in case if you're not here next week, to get the whole thought. I'll give you the references today. You may have them on your cross-references, but then next week we'll start right here in verse 15 and we'll look at the references. What I just said of Israel bringing forth the male child who will defeat Satan is Revelation 12, verses 1, 2, and 5. There are those who take it very specifically and say it's speaking to the woman. You call her Mary. In Hebrew, she's called Miriam, the one who was the mother of Yeshua Jesus. They take it right down to the very specific woman. I'll say, okay, that's fine. You can do that, but there is a broader meaning here also. 
the um, enmity that's going to be between your seed and her seed. We've just talked about her seed. Well, how does Satan, how does Satan have offspring? Is he giving birth to little devils? <laughs> you might feel that way sometimes. <laughs> but we'll notice, and we'll look at these scriptures. There were some men that were so antagonistic against Yeshua, Jesus, when he was in his earthly ministry, that he, and remember, in righteous anger, not in a fit of tirade and words that, that you regret later that you say, but in righteous anger, he called them out. You remember what he called them? Anyone know where I'm headed? You generation of vipers. 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 Rowena got it. <laughs> What's a viper? A it's a snake. Uh, yeah, it, it's, it's a serpent. It's a snake. We'll look at those verses. That doesn't sound to me yeah, like Satan's good. producing good seed that's that's working for him, but he gets into the heart of man and corrupts man all, all the more to do his dastardly deeds. But we'll look at that in Matthew 13, in Ephesians, well, Matthew 13, 39, in case if anybody doesn't make it back. Ephesians 2, 2, and 3, and then John 8, 44, which I quoted earlier, that Satan is called out as the father of all lies. Oh, yeah. Yes, okay? So those who are seeking to oppose God, to oppose his plan, to uh, oppose his redemption, we can look at it specifically as the Antichrist, whom Satan will indwell, much like apparently he indwelt the serpent, he's going to indwell the body of the Antichrist, who is absolutely coming against God and God's plan and against God's people, both the Jews and the believers. We'll see that from Daniel 7, 24 and 25. We'll see 2 Thessalonians 2, verses 3 and 4, and Revelation 13, verses 2 and 4 through 8. Those verses alone will give us a prophecy lesson next week, too. We'll be in prophecy. We'll be talking about um, end time overall, the end times. Okay, as we go on, we, we already said her seed is Messiah, and we see, I'll bring you out more examples of how Satan is trying to stop the Jewish race. Well, it wasn't even called a Jewish race back in Adam and Eve's day. There was no such thing at that point, but we know it comes down to being the race that we identify as a Jewish race that Messiah would be born into in his physical birth, that he would be of Jewish um, heritage. And we'll see that's why Satan tries to cut off the Jews, because if there's no Jews, then they can't give birth to the Messiah. Um, we'll look at all of that. And, uh, and then I want you to see also that this is also speaking of virgin birth. And we'll look at that, because I'll just throw you out the scientific question right now. Woman? Seed? Hmm. Man seed? Woman? Um... What's the word I want? <laughs> okay, I am really fried when I can't do this. Man's the one that has the seed. He inseminates the woman, okay? The woman, it doesn't say normally has seed. We'll look at that being a sign of virgin birth, that she is not con conceiving in the normal way. Okay, I'll have the word that I feel like I'm back in third grade. <laughs> But we'll see. There's a key phrase given in the book of Galatians. I'm only going to give you that hint that feeds this thought. I think when you hear it, you can go, oh, I never looked at it that way before. But it makes it very clear. So in this one verse, you get the plan of redemption. You get who it is. It's Messiah. You get what the, that his birth is a virgin birth. You get... Um, you get this whole, I'm trying to summarize it all. I'm having a horrible time because it's just, I'll use this word. It's pregnant. It's got so much to give us. It is amazing. So I don't mind us picking it back up, especially when we're all fresh. Me to teach it and us all to receive it. Um, but we'll see in this verse also not only the promise of the Messiah, the redemption for our souls, but we also see the end of Satan. Because we're going to see that the, the, this key phrase, he shall bruise you on the head, you shall bruise him on the heel. So all Satan can do is bruise Messiah's heel. How does he do that? I'll answer that next week. But when it says that Messiah bruises his head, if you bruise the head, and we're talking squish, crush, bruise from the Hebrew, you're dead. <laughs> Satan, your days are numbered. 
it's over. Your power is going to be gone. You are going to end up in the lake of fire. All of this out of this one verse, but I will take you to understand it fully into Galatians, into Isaiah 7, 14, into Jeremiah 31, verse 22, into Isaiah 9, 6. Those are just the ones that are jumping out at me right now. We'll see why it's real important to know the right translation because um, the older translations say, use the word it when it's referring to the Spirit of God who is he, not it. All of this in this very beginning verse. This first plan of redemption. God gave it all. He gave it on multi-layers. He gave it to everyone. He told what was coming. It is amazing. And that's just in chapter 3 of our Bible. Is that not awesome? And remember, he gave this promise before he laid out the consequences, the curse that would be on man. Yes, Dora. Okay, I have a question before you get too far. Uh, so where's the hope? I mean, in what? I, I don't see it here. The he hope? Said, yeah, after man fell and he's going to give him the punishment. And you said, right. although there's hope, he gave him hope where? The hope is right here in verse 15, that there's going to be this seed that would come who would crush the enemy. Okay. Oh. And this Jesus seed will also... Um, oh, yeah. Okay. Well, I guess that's all it says here. It's just that, that there is one who's coming who's going to be able to redeem you. That's what's being told in verse 15. There's one who's going to come who can crush your enemy and can release you from the curse judgment that this enemy has brought on you. And that's Messiah. Uh, and that's in verse 15. See, I just didn't see it. Really you didn't see the words in yeah. hope. Yes. Yeah. But it is our great hope. And it is reassured to us all the rest of the way through Scripture. You want, this is not one or two witnesses. This isn't three witnesses. This is witness after witness after witness. This is every generation. This is every, everything. The prophets, the priests, the tabernacle is a picture of it. The sacrificed lamb is a picture of it. Everything. I mean, my, I'm really frightened. I mean, I'm really, my mind is just not working up to its capacity right now. But all the way through Scripture, we see this redemption plan told us again and again and again and again. He gives it to us in many pictures. He gives it to us in many ways. He, he says in Hebrews 1, in days of old, I gave it to you through the prophets, through this one, through that one. Finally, I've given it to you in the Son himself. Go to the road of Emmaus. Oh, how I laugh. I, I hope God replays that scene for me and lets me listen. Because it says that, that as I walked on the, the road to, to Emmaus, and if you don't know the story, the two men have had a third man join their, their traveling companions. And the two men are depressed because they've just gone through the crucifixion. And the third says to them, what, what's the matter? Why are you so down? And they're like, have you not heard? Well, the Lord doesn't leave them depressed. He starts talking to them. And from the scriptures reveals who this third companion that's walking with them is. The one who walked with them on the road to Emmaus was none other than the resurrected Yeshua Jesus himself. Their eyes are finally open to that after they get to their destination. And they're like, wow, didn't our hearts burn within us when he was telling us the scriptures? God gives testimony after testimony after testimony of Genesis 3.15. But here he gives it and gives the whole thing. He didn't give a sneak peek. He didn't give one little bit. He didn't dangle a carrot and yank it. Now come here. Now come here. He says, no. Here's the whole enchilada. Here's the whole thing. Yes, there's curse now. There's separation. You've broken your fellowship with me. But I already planned the way of redemption. I'm going to send Messiah. He's going to crush the enemy. He's going to do away with sin. And he's going to redeem mankind. And you can have this relationship with me again that you just broke. That's amazing. That's wow. Wow. I mean, that's... Think about when you've done something really, really bad and you knew it and you were so afraid of how you're going to be dealt with. And that one who had the right to squash you... <laughs> Say, okay, there is a consequence, but here, let me pour out my love. And let me encircle you in that love and assure you, we're going to go on <coughs> together. That's, that's what we're seeing here. That's a loving father. If you didn't have a father to show you that example, don't judge God on the basis of your earthly father. Because this is a father 
who, yes, meets out punishment because nobody, if you got away with everything, you'd only get worse. Mm -hmm. But he knew how to meet it out and laugh. He wanted them to know, I've got a great plan for you. Don't look at Satan and think the same for you. No, I will redeem you. Here's my redemption. You don't have to end up in hell with Satan. That's love. That's love. Because it was just one simple commandment in the middle of a wonderful environment. They had everything they needed. It could be so easy for God to say, if you blew it here, forget you. But he doesn't. And that's what we see. Amazing grace. Amazing love. That he would die for one like I. I could go on and on and on, but I gotta quit. I see that clock. I hate clocks. There are no clocks in heaven. I get to go on forever in heaven. You all are probably very glad there's a clock. She finally has to stop. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm going to tell you, tick tock, God's clock. That's the one you want to know and be in tune with. <laughs> Any questions, comments before we close in prayer? Okay, we'll close in prayer. We'll open up the mics. We'll turn off recording so that Dora can talk with Maria. Lita. Maria, Maria. They got switched. That's why <laughs> Maria used to be in the corner. <laughs> okay, but let's go to prayer first so those who want to go or need to go can. And then, of course, comments before we let the two of you go at it. <laughs> ah, amazing grace. Amazing mercy. An amazing love, all given so freely from your throne, O God Most High. How thankful we are that you are Jehovah, the God who does enter covenant with your creation. How thankful we are that you are Elohim, the strong and the mighty and the faithful one. But we thank you also that you are the covenant keeper and that you've entered in a covenant with your man that you created, that you created it to have the glories of your heaven, to have a fellowship with you and Lord thank you when we blew it you redeemed us by your grace and your mercy only not by anything we ever can do to earn it Lord there's nothing that we just want to thank you we want to praise you and thank you forever we want to serve you out of adoration not out of I got to do it to earn something from you no we just want to show you our heart of thankfulness and Lord, we cannot wait till we can be in that final state with you forever and Satan in the lake of fire forever. Hallelujah. Thank you for telling us the final chapter. Thank you for not leaving us hanging or wondering in fear. Your perfect love does cast out all fear. And we praise you and we thank you. And we thank you that Satan can throw nothing at us that you cannot deliver us from victoriously between now and the day that we're home with you. Oh, you are amazing. You are an awesome God. You are ineffable. You are indescribable. You are our precious Lord, our precious Savior, our Messiah, and we praise you forever and ever. In Yeshua Jesus' name, <clears throat> amen. What a God. What an amazing God. Okay.